Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Adventist Country Living Journey Hello. Ministry. My name is Sharon, and this is my husband, Carlos. Hi. Okay, so I just want to have a quick announcement be before we begin. Um, if you aren't here to hear the, um, the testimony last uh, Saturday, we had a testimony from a sister, Anna, and uh, she's from Ukraine and how the local church over there in Colville is helping with the refugees because of the war that's happening. So th the people are, are running away from the city and they're running to the country areas and Colville Seventh-day Adventist Church is currently um, feeding them, housing them, and also providing spiritual resources as well, giving them Bible studies, great controversy, steps to Christ. Um, so we ask our members if they wanted to help out, especially a local Seventh-day Adventist church in Ukraine to donate to, um, Anna's PayPal and she'll take a screenshot of that and then she'll send it to the pastor and the pastor will send a screenshot that he received, he'll receive it and we'll have some pictures of, of their efforts over there. And the reason I wanted to help out a local Seventh-day Adventist church, instead of going um, through ADRA or this big organization because ADRA usually helps in the hot zones like at the border. Um, however, the local Seventh-day Adventist church that's helping, you know, the people there right now, they, they're not getting paid. I mean, there have been, ever since the war started, they couldn't go back to work. So whatever they have, they're sharing it with the refugees that's coming in. I believe last week they're currently housing um, 10 members in the basement. Um, so again, if you wish to donate, um, that's her PayPal account and uh, she'll be giving us some follow-up as well. And just so you know, we don't usually do this. <clears throat> we don't usually uh, do this kind of stuff, like uh, asking for to help, um, uh, like donations and stuff like that. We don't ask for donations for ourselves. As you can, uh, as you know, our, our ministry is self, uh, um, self-run, uh, self-supported, self and of course with the help of the Lord. But in this case, you know, this is a, a situation that's going on in Ukraine, uh, and uh, um, as you know, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a very bad situation. So this is why we're trying to see what, what we can do. Right? Help and uh, we as a church, um, we have this. Uh, um, I think all of us have this chance to be able to to be a blessing to these people in Ukraine, right? Right. And that's the reason why we do it because it's, it's, this is a very difficult situation. But we usually don't do this kind of stuff, uh, donating, asking for donations. Right. But she's she's one of our members and her family right now in um, in Ukraine. Uh, they are helping the uh, refugees so we just wanted to reach out and the thing is she's going to be able to update us so now as we move on let's ask brother don to um begin his part here brother don are you here i'm here okay okay brother don brother don as you know um and his colleagues um Brother Andrew, Brother Lynn, they are going to talk about planting the EGW method. And if this is your first time, I can assure you these are consecrated gentlemen who's been um, sharing this information to the remnant to prepare us. Brother Don and Brother Andrew, I believe, are um, professors. They also live in the country. And also Brother Lynn has been using this EGW method. So... Go ahead, Brother Don. It's your floor. Well, welcome, everybody. It's an honor to uh, uh, bring to you some more information about moving into the country. Um, as you know, if you've been following us the last several uh, episodes here, that I usually bring a guest along that's a specialist in the area. And um, Brother Andrew will be joining us in the second half of this, and I will be telling the story of the Ellen White method and Andrew will be explaining the the theory and scientific side of it as a biology uh, instructor that he is. And um, 
the gentleman that I'm going to be telling you about is Lynn Hoag, who is with us and will be available for questions and answers at the end. So um, I will tell you that this, um, our preparing for the time of trouble.com website has over 180 uh, videos on these kinds of topics. And the most popular one by far is this one. And we have had over 21,000 views on this video. So praise the Lord, and I'm excited to be able to share that with you. But let's start out with prayer again. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, giving us the uh, Bible and the spirit of prophecy and all of the exciting things that you've revealed to your people for the end times. And uh, please bless us as we uh, attempt to share this important topic tonight. And thank you for my colleagues who have uh, agreed to take their time to join and help out with this. I also wanna pray uh, for Justin and their ministry that you'll continue to lead them. Thank you for them stepping out and handing out great controversies at that event in Washington, DC. And thank you for Sharon and her team for uh, providing this platform. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, the topic is planting trees, the Ellen White method. Ellen White spent nine years of her life in Australia, 1991 to 1900, helping to develop the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the South Pacific region, and in particular, the establishment of Avondale School for Christian Workers, later named Avondale College. After these years in Australia, she wrote the classic, The Desire of Ages. Give me just a second as I make sure the share sound option is on. Okay. Um, no, it won't let me forward. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> According to Milton Raymond Hook of Andrews University, Avondale School was established in 1894, um, but the search was a lengthy process. I'm going to try to move this out of my way so I can see. There we go. One of the potential properties was Lakewood Estates, which was deep, cho which has deep chocolate colored, colored soil, but it was too expensive. The Brettsville Estate soil was sampled and considered poor and sour. When we were investigating the land at Kurenbong, our brethren held off from purchasing for a year to find some other locality land that would compare well with the rich soil of Loa. This, uh, they finally decided, could not be found. But the work was hindered for a whole year because some of the brethren did not have the faith to move forward in spite of the discouraging appearances. In the night season, a representation had been given me, Ellen White says, that revealed this lack of faith. It seemed to be on the Avondale land, and while horses were breaking away through the forest, I walked in an open space close to where our school buildings now stand. Uh, I saw a furrow made in the soil one foot deep and about four in length. Two of the brethren stood at the furrow, one at each end. They were examining the soil and declared it to be of no value. But one stood by who said, you have misjudged the worth of this land. He then explained the value of the different strata on the soil and their uses. We then came to Avondale to examine the estate. I went with the brethren to the tract of land. After a time, we came to the place I had dreamed of, and there was the furrow that I had seen. The brethren looked at it in surprise. How had it come to be there? They asked. Then I told them of the dream I had had. Well, they replied, you can see the soil is no good. That, I answered, was the testimony borne by the men in the dream. And that was given as the reason why they should not occupy the land. 
but one stood upon the upturned furrow and said, false testimony has been born concerning the soil. God can furnish a table in the wilderness. Manuscript releases, number 15. Um, I'm sorry, my the Zoom covers part of this reading. The man of whom uh, told me that it would be pleased to have me observe the way I had planted. Oh, this was a this was an individual, if I'm remembering the right part. This was a guy who specialized in soils and stuff. And um, so he told me that he would be pleased to have me observe the way they were planted. I then asked him to let me show him how I had been represented in the night season, how it should be planted. I invited him to visit me when these fruits would be ripe. He said to me, no need, no lesson for me to teach you how to plant trees. Our crops were very successful. The peaches were the most beautiful in coloring and the most delicious in flavor of any that I had tasted. We grew the large yellow Crawford and other varieties, grapes, apricots, nectarines, and plums. Unfortunately, Ellen White did not write down this formula of how to plant in the method that was shown her in this vision. But over, over 50 years ago, Lynn Hoe was with us tonight, was 13 years old. Prior to this, he was raised in India and saw firsthand the necessity of growing food. This sparked a passion in him that continues to this day. After his family returned to the United States, Lynn took advantage of a life-changing opportunity. He took a hands-on garden class taught by Herbert Clarence White. In this class, he was taught the Ellen White method of planting trees by her grandson. This method was given as a revelation in the night vision to Ellen White. Lynn has taught this same method ever since with some adaptations along the way. It also makes pine trees grow much faster. In this photo, you can see two trees. Both were planted on the same day. The one on the left, the Ellen White method, and the one on the right, the forestry method. The results speak for themselves. So he bought seedlings from the Forest Service and planted the one on, on our right the, the way they're instructed to do it, and he planted the one on our left, the Ellen White method. demonstrate a little bit of divine wisdom that God has given to his children at the end of time in these trees. And this is a tree that was planted what we call the Ellen White method. Uh, she was given this method in a dream and uh, I came across it when I was 13 years old. And every place I've lived from then until now, if I've lived there a year or more, I've planted trees this way. They've all done wonderfully well. This, uh, this tree is about, is a little over 10 feet tall. And uh, it's just about three and a half years since we planted them. Now, all of these trees were just six inches or, or so little twigs. These are sequoias, giant sequoia trees. They're little twigs when we planted them. Um, those that are planted over here are planted the way the forestry department recommends that they be planted. And the tallest of these is this one over here. Uh, it, it's about four and a half feet tall. So this is about a little over twice the height. Uh, but when we look at the size of the trunks and the amount of foliage, 
we have at least 20 to 1 uh, in mass, the amount of growth. And the same thing will happen with fruit trees, uh, with tomato vines, with grape vines, and other deep-rooted plants if you plant them the same way. Now we're going to have uh, Brother Andrew, um, who's a biology instructor for Andrews University, and he's a market gardener. He uh, maintains two large market gardens and has a uh, produce stand along the highway to uh, witness to people and to uh, make the produce available. And he will uh, talk about the scientific uh, theory behind uh, this method. So let me undo my sharing of screen. And Andrew, you can share your screen. Thank you, Brother Don. Appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> the Ellen White method, planting by the blueprint, uh, is is a, a very appropriate thing to be talking about right now, especially within the, the stream of time and where we are in in history as we look forward to, to the soon coming of Christ. Uh, we don't have 20, 30 years for a tree to grow to producing maturity. And God knew ahead of time that he, his people would need to be provided for in, in short order and uh, gave Ellen White this method as a way of providing uh, tree-borne food as well as tomatoes, grapes, and other deep-rooted plants, the opportunity to produce for them, preparing that table in the wilderness as referred to earlier uh, as, as needed for, for these times. <clears throat> So we're gonna we're gonna look at the the how and why of planting by the blueprint. So first of all, there's there's a basic uh, template or system of doing this. You start uh, with a hole in the ground, and you have a uh, working from the bottom up. You have some soil that's amended with some amendments that we'll talk about. Those are things added to the soil that give it <clears throat> nourishment and provide the ability for the trees to grow more rapidly. Uh, you have a, a an airspace, an air chamber at the bottom. It can be a clay or a, a can, uh, pot of some kind, plastic pot, whatever you can to create an air chamber. There's a rock layer that's important. We'll talk about that. There's a pure soil top layer, which is essentially just the mineral soil that you took off the top as you were beginning your, your hole for the tree that you're gonna be planting. And then on top, you'll have another, another layer of amended soil. And then finally topping off with a mulch layer that serves two purposes. One is, is moisture retention, and uh, the other would be weed abatement just to help to provide an ample amount of nourishment for, for the tree, as opposed to having to add a lot of extra things beyond. <clears throat> There's also a, a rock that has a special role in the, the process of the planting process. So looking at the, the way that it's planted, we have our tree, this is uh, getting ready to go. So we have a 20 pound rock that you need to obtain or find that is an important part of this process that basically functions as an anchor point for the tree. A seedling is fairly small as it grows larger. It helps to give the tree something to wrap around uh, and hold on to as it's uh, ready to, as it grows. Um, <clears throat> you can see that uh, they have the air chamber placed uh, midway up, it should be down uh, at the bottom in this diagram to allow the air chamber to be to be further down. Again, you can see the different mixtures here. And you have a rock mulch on top. In this case, they used a rock mulch. You can use different types of mulches, whether it be a, a bark mulch or a grass mulch. <clears throat> Basically, it helps in weed abatement and moisture retention. And they have three inches of leaf mulch in this case. So there are, there are different variations, but this is the, the general protocol for implementing the method here. <clears throat> There's one inch of compost that is uh, right below that leaf mulch. 
And around the tree is something to keep the rodents away. When I first planted our fruit trees, uh, before I actually knew the, knew the Ellen White method, uh, some of our trees, we uh, had some rodent damage over the winter. And this can around the tree is to help uh, prevent rodent damage. You can use uh, a hardware cloth mesh as well to serve the same purpose, keep rabbits and other rodents bowls from chewing on the bark and debarking the tree and, and killing it. You just want to be sure that as you do that, many trees put up suckers that are young growth that come out. Also that the tree trunk, just pay attention that as it grows, you want to be able to cut it off before the tree grows into the can <clears throat> and it starts to embed itself in the bark. So number five, the fifth layer, you're going to be having compost, peat moss, leaf mold, uh, uh, topsoil, and there's a, a a kit that can be obtained that makes the assembly of the different um, minerals and supplements more attainable uh, without as much searching, but there are also places that you can get the individual components depending on what's available to you. Uh, <clears throat> the sixth layer down is topsoil. You can see it right in the layer there where the air tile is. The air tile uh, belongs down uh, lower below the, the rock layer. Um, a layer of, of small rocks a variety of, of rocks. And then your final layer is again, a leaf mold, compost, topsoil, and mineral kit. <clears throat> so from uh, the Sun Country website, there is another, there are probably other places where it can be obtained as well. You can get a, a, a box of minerals and amendments that comes with it. This you could get, I think last time I checked, it was around $68, $70, and that would be enough for one tree. This would be added to the topsoil and mixed together with that topsoil to create the amended layers. There's two of those amended layers that you would add to your soil as you, as you implement the, the planting process. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So the directions uh, for, for doing this, the first thing and probably the most overwhelming component of it is the three by three by three foot hole. Uh, this is three feet wide, three feet deep, and uh, so three feet square, so a cube essentially. So you're gonna be separating the topsoil from the subsoil. Essentially the topsoil is the first foot or less depending on where you are. Uh, it's made up of organic material, uh, it's called humus, it's what the grass is growing out of and the other components. And you can see the layers change in the, the right diagram there. You can see the grass growing on top. It's dark and that's your topsoil. Then you move down into mineral soil and that has different horizons, we call it, or subsoil, which uh, goes through different, different layers of the soil. The, the nourishing layers of the topsoil are in the top. And as you go down, you get into more mineral, mineral soil. There's no organic matter other than roots and other odd and end buried things that may be in that, that lower layer. Tree roots do often penetrate, especially those with a tap root will penetrate down into that subsoil layer. Uh, but the topsoil layer is the area that has the most rich organic matter and is gonna be the most um, uh, accessible by, by the rain and other uh, surface uh, interactions. <clears throat> So there's different ways you can make that hole. You can do the, the, the elbow grease method, which is using a spade. This is uh, the most uh, taxing method. You can also have an excavator of varying size. So this gentleman is working on, on a sod excavation here, hole with a small excavator that takes a lot of the elbow grease effort out of it. Um, but however you decide to do it, uh, it uh, is an excavation process to get the, the hole to the appropriate, appropriate size for, for planting. <clears throat> so just plan on that when you're, when you're preparing. If you're gonna do a number of trees at the same time, maybe get the holes uh, dug uh, ahead of time. A large excavator could make a hole in one scoop. Uh, so that's fairly simple. Uh, <clears throat> or a backhoe. Uh, others may take a little bit more, more effort to create that hole. Secondly, take a, a two inch uh, uh, drain tile or a plastic pipe or a, a, a one gallon plot, pot, whether it be clay or plastic. And so on the bottom right, you can see a drain tile and, and around the foundation that's perforated. So it has, has um, air holes through the side as well as the tube itself. And that traps an air pocket down on the bottom of the hole and allows for 
uh, <clears throat> the beneficial aerobic uh, bacteria to be present and do their, do their work. The next uh, um, thing you're gonna do is you're gonna mix your backfill dirt. So you've taken and excavated the backfill dirt, you've separated it from topsoil as well, and from subsoil, and you're gonna be mixing your, uh, some equal parts uh, of these different components. So they'll be used in two uh, one foot layers. So you're gonna be using the topsoil in, uh, in your backfill dirt in two different layers that are one foot thick each. So you're gonna have topsoil, you're gonna to have uh, peat moss or leaf mold. You're gonna have some finished compost that could be manure that's well cured. Uh, for example, you wouldn't wanna use like fresh manure. You'd wanna use something that's been composted for a while. Then you're gonna add uh, 10 pounds of soft rock phosphate. And the, the phosphate is important for Thank carrying you. the nutrients. It enables the nutrients to, to get where they to go and they, they help to mobilize uh, the nutrients. How to grow a garden, so it's like, what kind of dirt colloidal phosphate. Um, it's rock phosphate. And it helps to, to mobilize the nutrients that you put in so they don't just get stuck and sequestered where you um, add them. You're gonna include one quart of seawater. So seawater, you can get that actually straight from the ocean. We are where we are on the West Coast, uh, we're fairly accessible to the ocean so we can get ocean water. You can also use something called C90. It's a trademarked uh, uh, composite made up of the same minerals that you would uh, find in seawater and uh, has the same ratio as the oceans. In fact, many people use it for for their home aquariums, if they have a saltwater aquarium, they'll use C90 to make up that water from wherever they are. <clears throat> so that seawater has lots of micronutrients in it. In fact, seawater has a very similar makeup from a, a, a nutrient level as, as human blood. Uh, so kelp, you also use, can also use kelp, half a cup of kelp. Then you're gonna use calcium and that can come in, uh, in the form of gypsum. Uh, it can be clay or dry. Uh, or dolomite, dolomite uh, lime, if you have a, a, a wet soil. <clears throat> and then azomite uh, for soggy soil. So those are three different uh, forms of, of calcium that can be used and, and they're beneficial for uh, the mix here. So gypsum for dry or clay soil, dolomite for wet for, and to help the pH, and then azomite for soggy soil for helping to uh, increase the yield and for pest resistance. So the fourth step is gonna be filling the bottom third of the hole with uh, the soil mix. So to tamp it down lightly as you put it in. So this is without the tree, you're just adding, adding the soil in. So the bottom third of the soil, and then you're gonna put a layer of small fista gravel sized rocks on top of that soil layer. So this is this top soil that you've just mixed. In step three, you've mixed that into a, a nice uniform mix of all those different ingredients. And then you're filling the bottom of the hole with that soil mix. And then on top of that, you'll add the layer of small rocks. So that rock layer is important. It, uh, Ian Jones did some research and noted that there was some electrical fields that were created by the presence of that rock layer that has a, a root drawing effect. So it's well below the root zone of the initial tree <clears throat> that you put in the, the bare root tree. And it helps to draw those roots down into the deeper soil and closer to the nutrients that are provided there for it. Uh, there is a pH uh, that's important. To, it creates some electrical conductivity. Uh, <clears throat> so that pH is important from a soil perspective in that it helps to uh, tell us what the electrical conductivity of the soil is. <clears throat> and that rock layer is going to help with that. So the pH also can be an indicator of the availability of nutrients that are there. Uh, so a low pH is, is, is acidic and typically the, the nutrient profile is low, it tends to be washed out. So in an area with heavy rainfall, uh, that's something that's very common. Nutrients are needing to be added back into the soil more frequently than in places where there is less rainfall. Uh, so place, and they typically have higher pHs or a more basic environment. And if it, as it continues to move up, there can be an excess amount of nutrients or ions actually left in the, in the soil. And sometimes over fertilizing can result in salination per se, <clears throat> or an over mineralization of it. In tropics uh, on the West Coast, 
uh, in places where you are within a, a heavy rainfall zone, a tropical rainforest or a temperate rainforest, which is where we live, uh, <clears throat> you have lots of rain that tends to, to carry the nutrients out by maintaining cover crops or having mulches that can help minimize the, the flow of those nutrients down out of the water table. <clears throat> so that's the role of the rock layer is helping to create an electrical field that helps to draw those roots uh, to the zone of nutrients and also to establish the tree and move it into a fruit producing um, realm as quick as possible. Step six, you're gonna add a foot of unamended topsoil. So that's just the regular mineral soil. Well, it's unamended topsoil, so it's not gonna be subsoil. Um, you can add some cottonseed meal as a nitrogen source. <clears throat> uh, you could also use uh, potentially alfalfa meal for that. You don't need a lot, just a couple of handfuls. Um, I would recommend checking for organic uh, alfalfa meal, organic cottonseed meal. Number one, it's gonna be pesticide and herbicide free. And number two, it's gonna be non-genetically modified. Uh, <clears throat> and there are more and more different crops that are moving that direction. I think in the US, alfalfa is mostly ungenetically -gen modified, but other parts of the world, uh, there is more genetically modified alfalfa uh, present each year. <clears throat> and cottonseed meal should just also pay attention to that. But you're not gonna need a lot, but it's gonna be a, a, a nitrogen source that you're adding to it. <clears throat> the, the 20 pound rock that's in the center of the hole, you're gonna place that in on top of that soil layer that you just put in. And this is what you're gonna kind of set your, your tree over the bare roots. Uh, so it's gonna kind of wrap around or sit on top and will wrap around this rock. Not only does it provide minerals as it breaks down, uh, it also is going to anchor the tree as, as the tree grows around it. Uh, often you'll have see, if you're hiking in the forest, you will see where a, a tree has grown down a cliff and penetrated around a rock, or even uh, just grasping around a rock at the edge of a, a, a lake or a seashore, and they, they will just uh, curve around those rocks. So if the root has a, a large tap root, this would be in the way of that. So it's not indispensable. If it has a large tap root, you don't want to chunk that tap root off. The tap root is important for helping to maintain its upright nature and will function as an anchor in its own right if the tree already has a large tap root present. But if there's not a large tap root, that's one of the roles that this, this uh, 20 pound rock in the center will function as. Some places have, have rodents that are very problematic. You can use uh, uh, a, a hardware cloth uh, wraparound. Uh, if gophers are an issue, down to about two feet. In some places, they are just pernicious little buggers and will just dig down and then come up in and underneath and around your hardware cloth if you just have it on the surface. In our locality, we didn't have to do that. We just had to keep the rabbits and other rodents from chewing the trunk itself because the, the vascular cambium is very sweet. And in the wintertime, that's something that the Rodents, when there isn't much other food available, especially when the snow is covering the ground, will, will come and feast on. So the lower tree here in the center has a very short hardware cloth. Uh, so if, there, if it was protecting from rabbits, this probably wouldn't be a super effective. It's probably more of a, a ground squirrel protector from a burrowing uh, animal. <clears throat> but uh, the rabbits would just probably hop right over that <clears throat> if they, they wanted to bad enough. But they do notice too that there is a, that apparently a sucker growing out of the side there. Those suckers over time just need to pay attention to those as the tree grows, that they don't get themselves woven into and pushing through the hardware cloth. I've had to trim mine out from time to time. So just a, a word of caution uh, on that to remove uh, those, those hardware cloth gopher uh, eliminators. <clears throat> So then you're going to cover that rock with, with topsoil. And, and then, uh, <clears throat> so the rock is going to be covered with the topsoil and then put that, that tree in its roots, spreading the roots over the rock, um, over top of the rock. So then it will grow. There's a little bit of a cushion there. So it's not directly on the rock itself, but it has that, that topsoil layer uh, there between the rock and the roots that you're placing around it. <clears throat> so then fill the top third of the hole um, over the top of the roots. Uh, with the amended soil. So mix it in and uh, with that soil mix and then tamp it in by foot. You don't want to use a ramming rod or anything like that to, to make it too solid, but tamp it down with, with your foot. Uh, if the tree has been grafted, 
it's been freshly grafted, don't put the, the dirt against the graft. Typically, most trees, you'll find a scar zone or a zone where the, the soil was growing up around its trunk as it was growing before it was brought to the nursery for your purchase. Uh, and just actually focus on putting the dirt to right about that level. You don't wanna go above that and, and then into the, into the grafting zone. So the lower left, you actually have a completely different um, trunk that's very obvious here. Many trees have a rootstock graft, which is more sturdy, more viable. And then they have a fruiting graft of a similar species that uh, bears fruit better than, than the, the root zone graft. So they're blending two characteristics. And then the vascular cambium, the um, lifeblood of the plant flows up through the bark layers and they join and grow together. So to just avoid the root zone when planting. <clears throat> so step 11, you can add worms. So there are red worms that you can get from, from your compost pile. Uh, you can also buy them from, from bait shops. Uh, the red worms, the red wigglers, the night crawlers, they're, they're very beneficial for working in the soil. You just put them in, in the soil. So they're gonna get covered up a little bit here and uh, they will be uh, beneficial in helping to work the soil in and around the tree. Then you're gonna put one to two inches uh, layer of compost or leaf mold as a final top dressing. So you can use grass clippings, you can use bark mulch, uh, leaf mold. Uh, they're again gonna be uh, weed abatement as well as a, a soil retention. The worms love the, the leaf mold and they'll be working through that leaf mold and they'll be dragging that down into the soil and enriching the soil uh, around your trees. We use uh, grass clippings extensively as well as uh, uh, the leaf mulch and, and bark uh, <clears throat> from not bark, but uh, chips that include the leaves as well as the, the bark of, of the trees that make the chips. So then you can also use a rodent collar. We mentioned that earlier with the hardware cloth. Uh, so the first one was basically in the root zone down below the soil. This one here is gonna be above the soil and prevent those gnawing uh, <clears throat> rodents from getting access to the vascular cambium. That, that nice juicy layer just under the bark. A variety of ways to do that. You can see the benefit of the mulch here, helping it to, it to actually be easier to mow around. Uh, so you're not gonna be weed whacking up and damaging the trunk with a weed whacker, uh, <clears throat> but it also helps to keep uh, the rodents from coming in. The one on the far right is actually a, a fairly decent design in the fact that it spirals around. It's not something you would have to cut off. And as a tree grows, it actually expands with the tree. The other examples here are uh, ones that you would probably need to adjust or remove. Um, you would have suckers that maybe would grow through them and cause problems depending on the tree that you have. So those suckers again are the new growth coming up from the base of, of the tree. So if uh, you know, you're interested in, in looking at this again, certainly feel free to go through the through the video uh, again as it's posted, but there's also a great video called Planting by the Blueprint. You can find it at plumprepared.com. And this particular video is put together by the Meisners of the Sustainable Preparedness um, textbook and uh, Craig and Nancy Meisner. And if you wouldn't mind praying for their family, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, he is, uh, Craig is suffering right now from uh, pancreatic cancer, and they are, are diligently working to uh, work with natural methods using God's remedies to bring about a, a health challenge or health change in a positive way for him. So if you could lift him up in, in prayer, that would be most appreciated. And that is uh, the nitty gritty of planting by the blueprint. Well, Andrew, thank you for doing such a thorough job. You know, when you think about what's all involved in this, isn't it amazing that uh, some people think that Ellen White's visions and dreams were not true? How could how could that possibly be something someone would just make up? So uh, I'm assuming that you can hear me and see my... Uh, title yes. applying the Ellen White method. Okay, thank you. Um, we're gonna wrap this up with uh, applying this from 
to other things. Uh, like uh, Len Hoeg said, it can be used for things besides fruit trees. It can be used for tomatoes and grapes and other deep rooted uh, vegetables. Um, I found online uh, a group who called this the tomato project and they applied the Ellen White method to doing tomatoes. Uh, one of Len Hoeg's findings is that this method works great with tomatoes. Most commercial tomato production achieves a yield of 15 to 35 tons per acre. This works out to be five to 12 pounds of harvestable tomatoes per plant. Long season tomato plants and greenhouses can double this to 10 to 25 pounds per year. To tomato plants grown with the tree planting method consistently yield 100 pounds per plant for large size varieties. So compare in a greenhouse 10 to 25 pounds and the Ellen White method, it's 100 pounds. Um, and here are some online resources uh, about the Ellen White planting method. Um, this one is the tomato project that I just talked about. That's the tomatoproject.net. And another one is Sun Country Gardens. This is Len Hoeg's uh, website. And he's got lots of resources as well as um, uh, supplements and things that if you can't find, for instance, salt water, he, he has alternatives for that available for purchase. <clears throat> Um, Andrew and I had the privilege of attending the Adv Adventist Agriculture Association Convention in 2019 in Oregon uh, State, and Len Hoeg uh, taught a class that my wife participated in. I was busy going to Dave Westbrook's Country Living uh, event. So these are things we, we agree to not go to the same things so we can learn twice as much. And this is the uh, different segments of Lynn's presentation at that event. And you can go to audioverse.org and listen to all of his presentations from that event, audioverse.org. Um, another online resource is a, a uh, uh, a demonstration of a family planting, going through the process of planting the Ellen White method. Um, if you go to YouTube and you search for jam-packed family, you'll find this, this video called the Ellen White planting by the blueprint. And then there's another one called End Time Country Living. And this gentleman does a step-by-step -step demonstration and explains the different layers. End time country living. And then there's country living experience, which also does a step by step demonstration. You can go to YouTube and search for country living experience. If this is going by too fast, um, this presentation will be posted um, on the uh, YouTube channel for Adventist Country Living Journey once they edit it and upload it. <clears throat> And then you can do screen captures and find them. Um, now this is Lynn Hoeg and um, I called him uh, earlier and we had a phone conversation because I wanted to find out some additional information, particularly about the ocean water. So this is, this is the recording, audio recording of our phone conversation. Let me make sure that I remembered to Share sound. Yes, it's checked. Okay, here we go. Uh, maybe here we go. I, I use the ocean water minerals uh, at, uh, you know, in the spring. I use it to, uh, on the fruit trees uh, every year. This year has been the worst year ever for peach leaf curl. Peach leaf curl is an uncontrolled growth of cells. <clears throat> It uh, is caused by a virus. And uh, so uh, we'll spray the trees with a solution of uh, water and, and uh, ocean minerals. Uh, and we'll also put some on the ground. I put about an ounce per fruit tree on the ground and uh, so that the roots will take it up. What will happen <clears throat> is that the disease 
uh, leaves will uh, die, turn black, and fall off the tree. If we have a leaf that is half diseased and half healthy, what will happen is that the diseased part will die and the healthier part will simply get healthier there. Uh, and then the side benefit to that is when we have all of those minerals in the ground and uh, the tree is taking it up, uh, those minerals are going into the fruit while they're being formed. Uh, when we do that, your, your fruit will taste incredibly better, whether it's peaches, nectarines, cherries, um, whatever. They'll just taste very, very much uh, sweeter and better. So try it and uh, compare your fruit then with uh, the best that you can buy in the grocery store, and you'll be pretty pleased uh, with the result. Now, in our case, we got a uh, quart or gallon milk containers with actual ocean water. So would you translate that to what you recommend we do here? Because it sounded like you had purchased some sea salt or something like that. Can you explain how, if you actually had ocean water, how much would you yep. do and where would you do it? Okay, uh, first make sure the ocean water came from a clean part of the ocean. Uh, don't go to something like San Francisco Bay or whatever, it'll be polluted there. Assuming that it's clean ocean water, use about a quart per tree, and you can just pour that out around the, the uh, base of the tree if you're going to water it in. Um, if, you're, uh, if you feel the need to, then take that quart, add 10 quarts of fresh water with it, and put that around the tree. Uh, it won't be too strong for anything, and uh, the tree will take it up, and you'll get the same results. If you're spraying the leaves with the ocean water, uh, then uh, take that quart of water. Uh, if we've got a diseased tree, take that quart of water, dilute it with five quarts of fresh water, and use that mixture uh, to spray the tree. Uh, if we have a sick tree, we need to be more aggressive uh, with it. That's why I'm doubling the strength. But if you don't have a diseased tree at this point, you just put it on the ground, or do you still want to spray the leaves? Uh, you don't need to spray the leaves. One, uh, uh, you could do either or both, but, uh, but with a healthy tree, um, take the ocean water, uh, add 10 quarts of fresh water, put that around the tree, that would be the best way to put it on. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Um, if you would like to review this uh, and not wait until uh, the edited version ends up on Adventist Country Living Journey, this is number 22 at preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com, number 22. We have with us um, myself and Andrew and Len Hoeg, who now you will see he has grown a beard since mm -hmm. those videos and photos were taken. Thank you, Len, for joining us. We appreciate it very much. And the way this works is that Sharon is reading YouTube and Facebook and um, uh, our platform here and Zoom and reading the comments and and bringing the questions forward. So uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Sharon, and I'll, uh, I'll mute myself because I'm not the authority on this one. <laughs> Thank you so much for that presentation, gentlemen. That was very helpful. Make sure when people say they're gonna teach about the Ellen White method, they actually teach you the right way because um, for some reason, we yeah, did. We have seen different versions of the Ellen White method. Different versions, <laughs> and we actually planted a tree that we thought was the Ellen White method, but the, there was no mention of the. Actually, the only thing they used about Ellen White method was the rock. Yeah, the rock. That's it. And that's it. <laughs> that, that's why the tree is dead right now. <laughs> so you live and learn. But thank you. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad I. Actually, I'm so glad about this presentation because I learned a lot. Mm -hmm.